Question one. In the case of the Cournot model, firms most likely A. Do cooperate and collude B. Compete on output quantities or C. Compete on product differentiation. So the kind of short definition of the Cournot model is we're assuming that other firms or firm in the case of a duopoly and there's only one other comp competitor um, and this is used in duopoly or oligopoly frameworks. Um, we're assuming that the other competition is maintaining constant output in the future. So we are maximizing our own profits based on that assumption. Um, so like I said, this is used under duopoly or oligopoly where services are similar and there's not much differentiation. Um, so we can go ahead and rule out C based on that. Um, we're not competing on differentiation. And they are setting output based on that assumption. And if there's another firm, they would also be doing the same thing. Um, so there's really no emphasis on colluding and cooperating, which is a function of oligopolies in some cases, um, but not in the case of the Corno model. Um, so we can rule out A and C and go with B. We're competing on output quantities. Question two. An oil drilling company plans to invest $14.3 in a project expected to generate $3.7 million per year for the next seven years. If the company's opportunity cost of capital is 8%, then the project's net present value is closest to. So I'm going to pull up our calculator here. We're going to be using the cash flows function. Um, I've got the numbers punched in already, but we'll walk through that. So we'll go to our cash flows. That cash flow at time zero is going to be our initial investment, so 14.3 million. We put the minus sign in there because that's cash going out um, from the oil company for the investment. From here, um, we'll punch in our positive cash flows going forward. So we've got 3.7 million, and that's going to be over the next seven years. So we've got 3.7 million in cash flow one, and then we can put our frequency at seven for the number of years there. Um, no other numbers we need to punch in here. So next we go to NPV and we've got our 8% discount rate. Um, scroll down and we'll hit compute and we get 4963569. Answer B. Question 3. ABC stock is trading at $75. Every year it has a 60% probability of increasing by 1.1 1 .1 and a 40% probability of decreasing by a factor of 1 tenth. So essentially um, going down by 10%. The probability that the stock will have risen in value after two years is closest to. So I'm going to pull in a couple things here, um, which is going to kind of start out as our probability tree. So the different um, probabilities of outcomes that could happen here. Um, so we can see here in year zero, we're starting with 75. We can either go up 1.1 or down. Um, so we're multiplying down by 10%, so we'll multiply by 0.9. So after one year, we can either bet, yeah, 82.5 or 67.5. And then year two, we've got um, those same outcomes. Um, so the, um, what we need here is the probability that the stock has risen in value after two years. So we're starting at 75. Um, so what we're really looking for here is in year two, which of these values is above 75? Our only one is um, uh, when we go up by 10% in both years. And so the next key here, once we have that number, is what are the um, what's the probability of each of those events occurring. So in year one, we had a 60% chance of going up. And then in year two, we had another 60% chance of going up per the reading. So essentially what we're doing there is we're going to just be multiplying those two probabilities together to get the uh, end probability of 0.36 or 36%. And we'll go with A. Question four. Which of the following is least likely a, region, a reason why a country may want to cooperate with others? 
So we've got national security, economic interests, or political self-determination. So two of these are reasons to cooperate and one is not, so we want to identify that one and we'll go with that. So A, national security, this is certainly a reason to cooperate, particularly if you're a smaller country um, with enemies and you don't necessarily have the resources or, uh, I guess, economic power to have the type of military like a country like the United States might have or other developed um, economies. Uh, so we can go ahead and cross that off. This is certainly a reason to cooperate with other countries. B, economic interest. This is also going to be a good reason to cooperate um, since this is uh, generally the way that you're going to be able to lift your country's um, cost of living, or not cost of living, your country's standard of living um, higher if you're able to economically cooperate with others and say export goods and sell more products and uh, essentially generate more revenue and profits for your country. And then lastly, political self-determination. Um, this um, will be our answer and could be a reason that you're not that a country doesn't want to cooperate. Western developed countries, um, as an example, may be less inclined to deal with or work with communist countries or countries that follow communist ideals um, or countries that uh, are less progressive and don't treat women as well for example um, and so if this is a requirement by by a country in order to you know do business um, the country may decide not to cooperate and because they want to be able to uh, set those <laughs> Um, standards for their citizens due to, you know, their own ideals or religion and whatnot. So, long-winded answer, uh, we'll go with C. Question 5. Which of the following statements are accurate? And we've got two statements here and different uh, combinations of them. So we've got either statement 1 is true, statement 2 is true, or both. Um, so statement 1. The rates quoted by most commercial banks are nominal interest rates. This is going to be accurate um, whenever you're looking on just like a bank website if they're saying whatever percentage, 3%, 5%, 2%. Um, they're not accounting for inflation in that, which is what you would see if it was a real rate. If it was a real rate, it, they would, it would say 1% plus inflation or 0.5% plus inflation or something like that. Um, so we can be pretty sure that that one is accurate and they're quoting nominal. Um, two, nominal interest rates are the sum of real interest rates and expected inflation. Um, the real interest rate is the rate of interest above inflation. Um, so essentially the real interest rate is, or the nominal interest rate is real interest rate plus expected inflation. So we can confidently say that uh, both these are accurate and see. Question six, Andrew Zeilman would like to rent a car for the next four years and wants to know how much money he would need in his account now to cover all the payments. His bank account has an annual interest rate of 6% compounded monthly and the cost of the rental is $340 a month. Zylman would most likely need. We've got three numbers here. Um, so I'm going to pull in the, uh, the numbers that we're going to be using and we're going to be plugging into our financial calculator. Um, so to walk through these quick, we'll have N of 48, which is going to be those four years multiplied by the 12 uh, monthly payments per year. Payment given is 340, um, and that's already monthly, so we don't need to adjust that. Interest rate, this is where it's a little tricky. We're going to punch in 0.5 because we're compounding 6% monthly. So we've got to take that 6% and divide it by 12, and then our... Uh, Future value will be zero um, since it doesn't say anything about, you know, there being a salvage value or anything like that that he'll be able to sell the car for. He's just going to pay the payments and then give it back. Um, so let's bring up the calculator here and punch in those numbers. So I've already got these plugged in. So we've got our N at 48, our interest at 0 0.5, the payment at 340, and future value at zero. 
compute uh, present value and we get 14,477. So we'll go with B. And where you could have really gotten tripped up here is if you don't adjust those interest rates. Um, so for example, if you put in N of 48, but then kept the interest rate at six, you hit compute present value and you know, you see here that gives you one of the answers. So you would have been quick to just kind of punt, put that in as your answer. Um, so we've got to always pay attention to the frequency per year when we're looking at the uh, present value or time value of money calculations. Question seven, what will most likely happen to the real exchange rate if the nominal exchange rate of dollar euro decreases and inflation remains the same? The exchange rate will decrease, increase, or remain unchanged. For questions like this, I find it easiest to just pull in the formula um, and kind of punch in easy numbers to really just show what it's going to do. So our formula is going to be nominal rate equals real plus inflation. We want to know what happens to the uh, real rate if nominal falls. So let, we'll just rearrange the formula to equal real. So now we've got nominal minus inflation equals real. So we'll start with nominal at 5 and drop it to 4, keeping inflation constant at 3. And we see that dropping that nominal um, is also bringing the real rate down. So we can conclude that that exchange rate will A, decrease. Question 8. A quantitative analyst has calculated the mean holding period return of 1% for 110 European corporate bonds with a standard deviation of 2%. If the analyst wants to test at a 5% level of significance that the mean HPR on European corporate bonds is different from zero, then the test statistic is closest to, we got 0 0.5, 5.24, 5 or 55 as our answers. So I'm gonna pull in the uh, test statistic um, formula here that we're going to be using and just walk through those numbers. So we've got our mean holding period return here of 1%. So we'll be plugging in 1% here. And our hypothesis sized value is going to be um, uh, what we're testing for. So we want to test to see if it's different from zero. So that'll be our hypothesis uh, value. And then from there, we've got standard deviation which we'll just plug in the number they gave us there, 2%, and that's gonna be over the square root of sample size, um, which will be 110 bonds. So really we're given all this information here, we just need to make sure we uh, know and understand this formula and know when to use it. Uh, so after uh, pulling all those numbers in that we just walked through, um, we've got one minus zero in the uh, denominator up here and then the numerator we've got two for the standard deviation and then divided by 110 uh, square root of 110 and that gives us 5.244 answer B question 9 which of the following is least likely a limitation of Monte Carlo simulation so two of these answers are going to be limitations of Monte Carlo and we need to rule out the one that is not a limitation um, a, Monte Carlo simulations provide exact figures, not statistical estimates of results. Um, this is uh, not a limitation, but it's also not correct. Um, Monte Carlo is providing estimates, not exact figures. It's running a bunch of different simulations and then providing estimates based on those simulations. Um, so this is probably going to be our answer. But let's make sure we can rule out B and C and uh, make sure these are limitations in Monte Carlo. Um, B, the complexity of the process may cause errors leading to the wrong results that can be potentially misleading. Um, this is certainly a limitation, um, particularly because w through this process you're going to have to make certain types of assumptions. Um, and that's where a lot of the errors can come into play if your assumptions aren't able to be translated into real life um, or don't become reality. It's going to be a uh, much different result than um, what ends up actually happening. Um, C. 
Monte Carlo simulations are relatively complex and can only be carried out using specifically designed software that may be expensive. This is also a limitation. Kind of goes back to what we were just saying with B. There's going to be it's complex. There's a lot of different assumptions that you'll need to um, put into it, and in order to have a robust um, simulation, you're going to need some software. You won't just be able to do it in Excel. Um, so we can rule out B and C and go with A. Question 10. Over five years, Portfolio A obtained an average return of 9% with a variance of 0.035. During the same period, Portfolio B obtained an average return of 11% with a variance of 0 0.050. Given that the covariance of the two investments is 0 0.010, the correlation coefficient between those returns is closest to. So we're going to pull in our correlation coefficient formula here. So we've got our covariance of A and B, which we're given um, at 0 0.010. And then we're going to be doing our standard deviation of A times standard deviation of B. We're given the variances of these, so we'll have to do the square root in order to get the proper answer. Um, but we're given all this information, so we can just pull that information in here. And we've got that 0 0.010, like we said, um, over the square roots of those two variances. Um, multiply it out, and we get 0 0.2390. Answer A.